Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. Let's pray after that and let's uh, start our study. Father, we, we pray now as we come to your word. Uh, Lord, this is important stuff. It's an important passage. We're taking our time over it and we ask, Lord, that you would give us a depth of understanding, that your spirit would convict us, that your spirit would speak to us, that we would become aware of your truth and that being aware of your truth, we would be changed by it. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just understand, but the things that you talk about here in your word, Lord, that we would do those things so that we could stand firm against the enemy, against his schemes, that we would be strong in you and that we would be able to be those who who serve you efficiently don't let the enemy have a foothold in this church we pray lord may we be strong in you and in the strength of your might amen okay ephesians 6 finally be strong in the lord and the strength of his might Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which you can ex- with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. We'll leave it there. We are week two into spiritual warfare now, having done a grand total of one verse last week. I'm going to pick it up a bit this week. We're going to try and hit two this week. Um, Normally, when we come to this passage, there's sermons about Roman soldiers and belts and shields and arrows and swords and that kind of stuff, and then you're done and dusted. But as we saw last time, that is a misunderstanding of the passage. When it says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand, there is a repetition of three different words, power, strength and might. Power, strength and might, three different words talking of a similar concept. Those same three words are combined with uh, the verb to be able, to be empowered. Those three nouns and that one verb are also used at the end of chapter 3. We looked, we spent a lot of time last week at the end of chapter 3 again, where chapter 3 concluded with a crescendo, with this prayer that God, having blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, we've been blessed, we've been given all that we need to be given. So what is it then that we need to do? Well, Paul says, I pray that you would be strengthened. And he talks about strength and power and might that we might be able. And so everything that we need, God has given to us, but we need to be strengthened in that strength that we might be able to be filled with all the fullness of God. That all that God wants to do in us and through us as individuals and corporately would be able to be done. And it's no accident that when we come to the end of chapter 6 and the end of the book, that we have a crescendo here, not an appendix as most people treat it as, but a crescendo that parallels the crescendo at the end of chapter 3. Same three words and same verb. Power, strength and uh, might. Or, or power, strength and... Uh, 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 yeah, power, strength and might will do. And we have these same things repeated. And so what it's saying is it's drawing our eyes, our attention to the end of chapter 3. So when it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might... Twice we're told our strength is in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
So we are not being commanded to be strong per se, so much as we are strong in the fact that we are strong in him and that we have his strength and his might. And that takes us back, as we saw last time, to the entirety of the first three chapters, where we're told by Paul that God chose us before the foundation of the world. The Father chose us. The Son redeemed us. He set us free from our sin. And the Spirit of God was given to us and indwells us and is a seal guaranteeing that God will complete his work of redemption. And that indwelling Holy Spirit is then central to all of Paul's theological arguments that follow, as we've seen throughout this book. So when we're told in chapter 6, be strong in the Lord, that phrase is not new to us, those of us who've been here since chapter 1. We've seen in Christ, in the Lord, in him, in whom. And there is this association that we have with Jesus Christ, where we are in him and he is in us. And this is accomplished because the Holy Spirit, his Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, indwells us. And that creates a connection with us and him, that is greater than if he were here next to us in the flesh. He told the disciples, it's better for you that I leave, because I will send another. It was better for the disciples that they transitioned from the old covenant, where Jesus, indwelt by the Spirit, was with them, the temple of God, that they transitioned from that to the new covenant, where Jesus was in them through the Holy Spirit and they became the temples of God. That was better. And we as Christians are now here as temples of the Holy Spirit. And so when he says to us, be strong in the Lord, our strength is in our association with Christ. And in the strength of his might. Our strength comes from, as Paul says, that you're strengthened through knowing, through learning, through hearing, through understanding. So, when I say to you, the Father chose you before the foundation of the world, that's not merely some intellectual, theological fact for you to file away. That is power. That is you and I having something that empowers us, that strengthens us, that helps us to stand. When I say to you that the Spirit of God within you is a seal, it's a guarantee, it's a deposit. He is your down payment guaranteeing that one day God will complete that work of redemption and these bodies that fail and fade and let us down will be replaced that we will be glorified, that he who rose from the dead was the first fruits of, of resurrection and we will one day raise from the dead as well. That this sin, this sin that entangles us, this sin in our old nature that we have to keep putting off and yet keeps coming back to us, this sin that we struggle with and we fight with, that one day that battle will be over and we can be before him face to face. This is our power. Because the enemy is constantly trying to get us to look at circumstances, to look at our sin, to look at our frailty. And our strength is not in us. Our strength is not in our failings. Our strength is not in our sin. Our strength is not in the uncertainties and vagaries of life before us. Our strength is in the Lord. And it is the strength of His might. And we're going to talk more about that next time. I was hoping this week we would come and talk about the armour of God, but we're going to do that next time. Keep postponing it. And when we do come to the armour of God, we're going to spend a whole bunch of time in Isaiah. And we're going to see that all this imagery that is used is nothing new, it was used before. And the imagery, as I told you last time, was used of God because He is the warrior. We're not the warrior, He's the warrior. And we are warriors by default, or perhaps 
Now maybe we'll talk about this next time. We corporately are a warrior by default because we are indwelt by the one who is the warrior. It is his might, it is his strength and not ours. And so because we are going to be strong in his uh, in the Lord and in the might in the strength of his might because we're going to be strong and it's his strength we're commanded to put on the whole armor of God now we're going to talk about that next time don't want to get ahead of myself but we're going to put it on and so in this process what needs to happen what, what we need has been given to us. This has been the theme right the way through the book of Ephesians. We've received every spiritual blessing. We do not come to God and say, God, I need you to do this so that I can do this. There's no more blessings we need. He's given it all to us. But yet there is something we need to do with what he has given to us. And we saw back in Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, we were told... Um, verse 22 and following to put off the old self so we have a sinful nature we have a nature that is corrupted by sin and we always will do until we receive our new bodies that's because guys our sin is hardwired in our bodies now Paul was thousands of years before the discovery of DNA but he did have a good understanding of it did he not? in that he understood that sin was hardwired into our body. For Paul, where is sin? Where is sin? Sin is in the flesh. Sin is in the body. How does the spirit work? The spirit's realm is the mind. We become changed through renewing our minds, through learning, through understanding. But the, 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 the sin, sin works in the flesh, in the body. So it's worth noting that whatever our DNA is does have a huge effect on us. It makes us prone to all sorts of sins. That doesn't mean that those sins are justifiable. We need to be free from our flesh and free from our sin. And the way we do it, verse 22 of chapter 4, is we put off the old self because that's our former manner. And then we're renewed in our minds. So we take off the old put off the old, we're renewed in our minds, and we put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So there is a putting off the sinful nature, there is a renewing of the mind, and there is a putting on. And that is the same phrase exactly that is used here in Ephesians 6. Just as we have a responsibility to put on the new way of living, putting off the old way, having our mind changed about what is righteous and what is good, and then putting on that lifestyle, so we are to put on the armour of God. That's our responsibility to put it on. And we'll talk about what that is as we come to it next time. But we're going to put on the whole armour of God. If you are a soldier in battle and you put on half your armour and not the other half of your armour, you know exactly where the enemy is going to be shooting for, don't you? So we want to put on the whole armour of God. And that, for the reason that, so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So, putting on the armour of God, next week's sermon, is what we're going to do so that we are able to stand. Now, standing, again, and this is a crescendo of Ephesians, so we're constantly looking back because we have the context of the whole book. But when we saw in uh, chapter 4 that the result of, uh, uh, of, of us maturing in the faith in chapter 4 and verse 14 is that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried by every wind of doctrine. And that's what was, we were looking at there, was that when we mature and we grow in knowledge and we grow in understanding and we know our Bibles better, then we don't get blown to and fro. Uh, I am constantly amazed, I shouldn't be, but I'm constantly amazed at how Christians have, who have somehow come to public prominence will utter such nonsense. Just complete drivel coming out of people's mouths in the name of God because they put aside their Bibles. And then what happens is, and you'll see this in the church, every generation, 
society shifts. The, the winds of change blow. Whoosh, and everybody in society believes one way, and then the wind shifts, and whoosh, everybody in society starts to believe a different way. And when you see the church shifting with society, then we've got a problem. Standing firm, not being blown away by winds and waves of doctrines. That's going to be the result. But specifically here, we're going to stand firm. We're going to stand against the schemes of the devil. So the devil is trying to get uh, a scenario to happen. He has an end game, as it were. The stuff that he wants to do. He has schemes, he has plans. And we need to stand against that. We do not want to be part of the enemy's work. Now, if we don't stand against the world, which is the realm of Satan, then we cannot stand against him. If we're going to stand against his schemes, it's going to mean against the world, and sometimes against the church. We need to make sure that we're fighting the enemy constantly. Now, this is our key bit. Four, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I don't know how many times I've heard this, taught this, thought over this, considered this, been corrected by this. I still need to keep hearing it. And I don't think it's any accident that we come to this passage on the last Sunday before the election. <laughs> now, I don't do political stuff. I'm not, there are pastors in churches around the land that give you checklists telling you what policies they are and who you should be voting for. I think that's an abuse of the pulpit. Vote for whoever you want to vote for. Make your own minds up. I think we should apply principles of grace and kindness when people disagree with us. When people consider the certain policies more important than the policies we consider and they take scripture and they weigh things up in a different way than we weigh things up, then we're always going to have to have grace for one another. The fact that churches are, get split up and friendships get split up over politics is ridiculous. The fact that there are some churches you're not even welcome in unless you vote for the right person is even more disgusting. We can differ, differ in all sorts of things and we can love one another in Christ. So let's get that out to start with. And that's why I keep away from politics, because I don't want to imply that people have to think the way I think. My goodness, you don't want to think the way I think on everything. When it comes to the Bible, we need to be in agreement. But outside of that, there's lots of room for disagreement. And until we, get a, until we get a candidate who re represents the scripture in every area, then there's always room for disagreement. And that's coming. That's coming. He's coming. He's on his way. And he will come and he will rule and he will reign. There won't be a vote. <laughs> but he will be godly and righteous in all his actions and his decisions and all his judging. And we look forward to that day. And until then, there's room for disagreement. But let me say this to you all. Neither Hillary Clinton nor Donald Trump is your enemy. Satan is your enemy. Get your heads around that, please. Especially as we have this running to the election. Get your heads around that. These people are not your enemies. Satan is your enemy. You're just trying to figure out which one he's got more control over. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and I think we've seen plenty of evidence to suggest that, that he's doing a grand job all round in those regards. And that's as deep as I'm going to go on that. <sighs> I do hate election season. <laughs> you know, it's, it's spin and it's everyone pushing their own sides. And do you know what I'm all about? I'm about truth. The truth of God's word. And everyone's is gossip and innuendo and this and that. And <sighs> <sighs> Satan's our enemy. Let's fight him. Okay? 
and it's not, he's not fought in the polling booth. What you, how you vote is, it, you know, I'm not saying it's unimportant, okay? I'm not saying it's unimportant. I know to, to many of you it's very important, and, and I get that. But far more important is what happens when Satan comes tempting, and how you stand against that. You know? The person who votes for a different candidate than you vote for could be the person that comes alongside you and loves you and sacrifices for you when you really need it because their love is going to stand against the enemy. This is, this is the important stuff and this is what matters. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but in contrast to that and actually before I move on I, I got delayed by politics let, let, me just, let me just say we don't wage against flesh and blood with non-politicians either. I mean, it, it, it's obvious that it, the text here stands, but for whoever it might be, whether, whether it's a person at work that really gets your goat, whether it's someone who you just, just, who constantly hurts you and harms you, you know, whether you've been persecuted and, and hurt by those in the faith, those outside of the faith, you know, the, the reality is, is they are not the ones we struggle against. We've got to deal with them, We've got to respond to them. I'm not saying, that, saying we don't. I'm not saying we just take a step back and say, hey, nothing to do with me. We've got to respond to each and every person that we deal with in this world, and hopefully in a righteous manner. But the battle is against the enemy. And this is the contrast. It's not against flesh and blood, but against. Now look at this list. This is interesting. The rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now this is where I want to get my teeth into stuff, okay? Firstly, if you come from wildly unbiblical, extreme, pluck it out of thin air, oh look there's a rabbit up my sleeve kind of charismatic circles, then you may have heard all sorts of nonsense taught about this. And I've, I've read and heard and, and seen people teach this passage along the lines where authorities and then there's rulers and it's a hierarchical system and they've got this whole plan. I mean, they could tell, they could, there were entire books written about how Satan structures his armies. The Bible doesn't tell us, but they know. And the, the, you know, the real irony is, is in some of the real extremes, they know because an angel has told them. Which means that they're getting their, their input from an, someone appearing to be an angel of light. In other words, you know, it may well be Satan leaked information, which gives you no assurance as to its truth at all. Listen, first of all, look at this. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces of evil are the same things. It is four different ways of looking and expressing these things. If there is any distinction between them, then it is minimal and minor, and we certainly have no basis for knowing that. So it would be dangerous to teach otherwise. What I do want to do though, like we did last week, is because this is the crescendo of Paul's argument, because this is, this is it, this is, God's done all of this for us, we should live this way, and the enemy's against you, and this is how you're going to stand and live as you should because of all God's done for you. This is the crescendo, the finale of the whole book. Our context is so much what's happened previously in the book. So keeping your finger in Ephesians 6, turn back to Ephesians 1. Man, I love going back to these bits because there's some good passages and we've done them and they're, they're behind us now, but they're so good. By the way, when we come next year, God willing, visa permitting, we're here next year doing Colossians, then Colossians was sent out at the same time as Ephesians and it rests on a lot of the same understanding as Ephesians and part of the reason for me to do Colossians is we can keep referring back to Ephesians when we do Colossians as well. So these passages will become our, our friends that we love more dearly as we get to know them better and better. But at the end of Ephesians 1, having said that the Spirit indwells us and that this is our guarantee uh, of, of inheritance, that then he says he prays for them and he prays that in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. 
So just like in 6 we have uh, power, strength and might together, in, in chapter 1 we had wisdom, revelation and knowledge together. That's the realm in which God works. God's blessed us, he's given us everything, but now we need to understand it. Having the heart, eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, so enlightened and know, more of these kind of words, the hope to which he has called you, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. So there's three things. This is being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. There's three things he tells us that we need to know. We need to know the hope that we have, the riches of his inheritance, that's the blessings he's given us, and the immeasurable greatness of his power. Three things. I'm kind of doing a sermon on chapter 1 now, but just in passing because it's too good to overlook. We need to know ever better the hope that we have in the future, where God's taking us, what he's going to do with us. When life sucks right here, right now, there's always the hope of what is to come. When we were strangled by our own sin and we're beaten by the sins of others, we look to the time when we will struggle no more. That's our hope. Then there is the riches that he's given to us. When God seems distant, and when life gives the impression that he is not kind, that he is not loving, that he is not gracious, then we look at the riches that he's given, how he chose us before the foundation of the world, how he redeemed us through the blood of his son that he gave to us. That's what we need to know and understand. And thirdly, the immeasurable greatness of his power. That's the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's us empowered by him. And it's in that context, he says, according to the working of his great might, same word that we have in chapter 6 that we're dealing with, same context, his might, that he worked in Christ, as in him again, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and put him at the right hand of the Father, seats him in the heavenly realms, that same power indwells us. That's the Spirit of God. Man, it's a good passage to come back to, isn't it? But he goes on. He seated him in the heavenly places far above so where Jesus sits in the spiritual realm, he's left the physical realm, okay? He was here, he came in the incarnation to the physical realm. He is now in the spiritual realm. The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead and has placed him in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly places, far above all rule, chapter 6, rulers, all authority, chapter 6, authorities, and power and dominion. And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. In other words, what the end of chapter 1 is saying is that Jesus Christ was elevated to the point that through his resurrection he was given a position that was above every other spiritual being, or rulers, authorities and powers. Yes, physical rulers on this earth, but more so in the context of Ephesians, all spiritual powers. Because he is the one who raised from the dead. He is the one who conquered death. He is the one who conquered sin. And the point in context is that that same power indwells us. And it's because, in verse 22 of chapter 1, that all things are under his feet, that he is the head of all things. If everything else is below him, he is head over everything. To the church, gave him as head to the church. Oh, this is great. Jesus, who is over all, who is greater than all, who is more powerful than all, has been given to us, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. Everything, okay, who fills all? Everyone has a need, and all of that need is met in Christ. And all that need is found in us because Christ is in us. That's really powerful. But the connection in chapter 1 is that every ruler, every authority, every power 
Christ is over them all, and the power that raised Christ from the dead, that gave him victory, is the same power within us. That we are in Christ, that we're associated with him, and even chapter 1 links Christ and that power to the church. So we are standing, chapter 6, we are standing and we are fighting against rulers who have been conquered by Christ. They rule. They rule. They are in charge. They are authorities. They have authority. They are leaders. And people do as they say. And they are movers and they are shakers. And remember, there is not the party of the devil and the party of God. Every politician that I can think of is a has a lot, of, a lot of sin in them. And the reality is, is that there are rulers and authorities who are not human people. Who are moving and shaking and directing things in this life and this world and this planet. And if you think that the way in which you're going to defeat those authorities is in a voting booth, you are having a laugh. You are deeply misled. If you think that somehow that by toppling one leader you will topple some conspiracy of powers and bankers and corporations and what have you and that somehow you'll end up living in some sort of Christian utopia, you are kidding yourselves. There are rulers and authorities that have power on this earth. And I don't want to read a book about it because none of us know about it. We just simply know that they're there and they rule. The book of Daniel talks about a prince of Persia. So perhaps they have geographical boundaries that are given to them. But we are fighting them. And we've already beaten them. Because they were conquered by Christ our Christ, who indwells us. So we don't wrestle them as someone who is outmuscled by them. If we fight them in our strength, we are useless, and they will outmuscle us, and they are stronger than us, because they change everything in this world. They affect how people think, what people consider to be right, what people consider to be wrong. They affect how people view God, how people view life. But, in the strength of His might, they are no match for us. Now, it goes beyond that, because in Ephesians we go beyond chapter 1 to chapter... Looking at my underlinings, chapter 3. Those of you who... Uh, who want to become great theologians and scholars, you may be able to see a chiastic structure here where we kind of, we have a mirror as it were. We have strong strength might at the end of chapter 6, like we did in chapter 3, but also before that in chapter 3, we have rulers, authorities and heavenly places. And in chapter 6, after the strength, might and power, we have rulers, authorities, and heavenly places. So let's look at chapter 3, where he says, uh, in verse 7 of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. Same thing. To me, though I'm the very least of the saints, this grace was given. So Paul, the least of the saints, nothing special about him, but he is empowered to do the ministry he does. And here's his ministry, to preach, the God, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Two, to bring light for everyone, uh, to bring light for everyone what is the plan of, uh, mystery, of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. And three, so that the through the church the manifold uh, wisdom of God might be made known. Now here's the thing. Paul has said, by God's power, he, the least of the saints, okay, by his power, he's going to do three things. He's going to preach to the Gentiles. Two, he is going to bring to light the plan of God. 
Okay? So these are all overlap because he's going to preach to the Gentiles the riches of grace. God, God chose you, Jesus died for you, the Spirit is in you. These are things that the, Gentile, the Jews didn't see the Gentiles having, that they would come together in one body with the, with the Jews into this one church. He, Paul's going to preach that message. He's going to unravel this mystery that was hidden of this one body. He's going to unravel it and show people for, for eternity. And thirdly, he's gonna, he says his, his ministry is so that through the church, Okay? So the church is how this is going to happen. Okay? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. So the church, that's us, Christians, we are exposing, we are showing, we are revealing God's wisdom. You look at us, you see how wise God is. Isn't that bizarre? And who, who is he showing how wise he is to through us? Made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Not only does Jesus conquer the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Not only does he outrank them, outmuscle them, outpower them, not only do we have that power, more so as we saw in chapter 3, and I remember being bowled away by it at the time, that God is basically showing off to demonic powers by using us to show how awesome he is. Now, when we take that concept and we put that concept into Ephesians 6, okay, we, we the church, we corporately, we as individuals, we the people of God, we are wrestling, we are in a battle, we are in a fight. We are not fighting against politicians, we're not fighting against our neighbours or our family, we're not fighting against any human person, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. What we're fighting against is rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. You think this land is dark? The land is dark, was dark in that time as well. That this world, at this time, and by this time I don't mean this century, this year, I mean this period of time following Christ, in these end times, it is a present darkness. And there are rulers and authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. Four different phrases that we tend to use a fifth one to speak of these creatures, which is demons. Now, I'm going to come back to my point because I want to end with that. But this needs to be said in between. There are books out there, as I've said already, that tell you everything about demons. And what you do is you come away being wowed by Satan. Oh, look at all those scary stories of all those things that happened to this person and that person. And then you get Christians who, who, who look for monsters under the bed because that's where demons dwell. And you get Christians who, oh, you, you, you're struggling to give up that sin, let me cast that demon out of you. And it's just, you know, we'll deal with that in Mark, because we're coming up to exorcisms in Mark for our evening studies. But it's just all rubbish. This is demons. Demons, demonic, demonic power. This is it right here, chapter 6. We wrestle against it. We don't stomp on it. We don't, we don't cast things out of people. We don't look under our beds and, and get scared when the lights are off. We wrestle with them in the spiritual realm, okay? But this is the realm of demons, this is how demons work. And what we see from Ephesians is, is that these demons have been conquered. I think sometimes Christians are more informed about the demonic realm from horror movies than they are from their Bibles. Yeah? Now, I'm not knocking it, because I know there are people who like that kind of thing, they like to be scared and what have you, and I don't mind the, good, or, or the old ghost story and horror movie, but just remember that when you watch a 
true life based on real events horror movie that it's as real spiritually speaking as when you go and watch Star Wars you know and we just got to remember that this uh, this demonic realm was presented in Hollywood is a galaxy much further away than the realities or thereof of, or, or otherwise of Star Wars. What I'm trying to say to you is this. If a demonic being physically manifested in front of you, and we could debate for hours on whether that's possible or what have you, and whether that happened in Scripture, you, you do, do you understand who you are in Christ? You, there's, there's no danger of some demonic being doing something to you. There are Christians who spend their lives thinking they're under a curse for crying out loud. I tell you what you're under. You're under the blessings of God. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing and every, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He's given you his Holy Spirit who has conquered every ruler, every authority, every power. There's nothing to fear. But we wrestle against them. Okay? In the spiritual realm. And we're going to see how that wrestling looks. We're going to wrestle by putting on armour and we're going to wrestle by standing and we're going to wrestle by taking up. That's what we're going to do. Okay? And that's how we deal with the demonic realm. Don't get distracted by suspicions and, and hocus pocus stories. Okay? This is the demonic realm. You know what? If Satan can get you to believe a lie about God, that's the realm where he wants you to fall. You know, when you look at the struggles and the trials in your life, and that thought comes into your head, where's God's love in this? Does he really care for you? How can he be real if he's a God of love and all of this kind of stuff happens? That's, that's the realm of the devil. Not the, not the, the boogeyman under the bed. Not the ghostly figure walking past the window. That's the realm of the devil. Right there. Because that's where we're vulnerable. But the main point of the message today is that we see this in the context of Ephesians where these rulers, these powers, these authorities that do have power, that do have authority, that do accomplish things that they are a lesser power than Christ and that Christ goes to those powers and says nah, look how clever I am and then he whips out, he pulls back the curtains, and he sees us. Get your heads around that. And that's why when Satan comes, and when I say Satan in the broadest sense, I'm talking about the demonic realm generally. I've got to stop doing that, haven't I? Satan is not omnipresent like God. One place, one time. Probably got no interest in you or I per se. Happy to let his minions deal with it. <laughs> We're not that important. <laughs> we sometimes give him too much credit, don't we? But when the enemy, plural concept, when the enemy comes to us, he's coming as someone defeated by the very powers that indwell us. He's coming as, as one who has been crushed. And look, in this room today, I, I've, I've had American friends come to me, and just recently, in fact, someone was just saying the other day, just about the, the, the racial conflict that still exists often in this country. And there are, there is, there are churches that where if you don't vote for a certain party, you can't fit in there. You know, and, and we have in this room today, although we're, you know, we're growing but we're still relatively small, we've got people of different ages, different backgrounds, different social situations, different races, di di you know, different politics. And we're all here united together. And do you know what that says? That says, you've been defeated. That's what it says. 
It says you've been defeated because this group of people come together because they are in Christ. And the very fact that we're here together, listening to the Word of God preached in this world, when you can tweet and you can, you can look at this video and that video and watch this channel and that channel, and you've got everything coming, and here you are listening to a book that was written 2,000 years ago being explained to you, says that they've lost. Christ is alive and well through us. And though this, this present darkness may be ever so dark, and though we may get battered by the enemy, though we may get battered in life, and though we get, may get battered by our own sin, just look at yourselves. Jesus is one. And his fullness, that is all that he wants to do in our lives, is available to us corporately through the manifold gifts that he's given to each one of us through the same Holy Spirit. We don't have to go out and seek anything else. We just stand. We're going to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We're going to put on the armour of God next time. <laughs> and we will stand against the schemes of the enemy. We're not fighting against each other, not fighting against our neighbours, not fighting against politicians. We're fighting against Satan, we're fighting against his powers. And the good news is that Jesus was raised from the dead and he was raised above them and he's over them all. His power is greater than all and that same power indwells us. And he presents us as evidence to those powers of his great wisdom. Jew and Gentile, different backgrounds, different ages, different everything, and look at us all here gathered together. Because Christ is in us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you that the battle is won in you. Father, I'm, I'm excited to press on in this passage and to see what it is we do to prevent the enemy winning those little battles day to day in our lives. But I'm so glad that the war is won. I'm so glad that there is nothing that the enemy can bring against us that we cannot stand against in you. Help us to be stronger, Lord. Help us to know you better. The riches of your grace. The hope that we have. The power that's within us. Lord, I know that in such difficult times, I personally am so easily distracted by circumstance. May I know you better. May each of us chew over your attributes. Remember how kind you are, how long-suffering you are, the love that you show us, the mercy that you have, your desire to forgive. We thank you for who you are. May you be our focus. May you be our strength. And may we stand against the enemy individually and together as a church. Amen.